waiting for the feds to approve my licenses and really for all the local, for all of my construction to get through all of its inspections and approvals. That all kind of happened at the same time. And that financing, back to your financing question and funding, had all been part of the business plan and part of the investment and part of the, this is what you're going to need if you want to do this. That's good information. Um, Jaden Jaden is asking, uh, what tips and information can you provide for those of us that wish to eventually transition from U-Brew to production? Uh, I'm assuming... Uh, the U brew is, uh, you know, it's like the the brew in house thing where you go brew it at the space and then they, they, you put it together, they ferment it, and then you come back and you bottle it and then you take it home. Oh, yeah. oh, so um, I'm sorry. Were they going to open a U brew it? Um, no, they already have. They one. already have a U brew and they want to move into production okay. as an actual meadery. And uh, this is Jaden's in Western Canada, so the rules are a little different up there, but. Um, <laughs> You know, it's still it's still a it's still a uh, thing. They're doing the Uber process. There's a few of them in the states. There's one that used to be in Grand, Ra- Grand Rapids. I knew the owners, and um, they were doing that. And it's oh, it's, it's very cool. It's very cool, yeah. Because you get to go in and you make your mead, and then you and then you uh, set it to ferment, and then you go home, and then they call you when it's ready. <laughs> And you go in and you and you run their little bottling thing, and you bottle all your mead, and then you take it away with you. <laughs> Oh, dang. That is really cool. It is really well, cool. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I, I, you know, I would say, well, number one since, um, uh, is go find out what's required to be go from a U-brew to be a brew yourself because that's going to be about r- local rules, laws, and regulations that I don't know anything about. Um, but it sounds like uh, Jaden's already running a business, so uh, – they're probably familiar with their strengths and weaknesses already, so they're well along their way um, in terms of knowing what they're good at and what they need help with. That's always a really good first step. And um, what uh, was helpful to me was to go look at a lot of other, whether they're wineries or I visited cideries, wineries, and meteries, kind of see – what that looks like uh, because it's going to be really important to decide what what is that meadery like? Um, Is this a place you want to operate a tasting room? Do you want to have a late night bar? Do you want to have production only? Do you want to distribute around the world or just be local? You know, just kind of sitting with so many different questions. What kind of mead do you want to make? What's your, uh, connection to it, going back to that uh, juicy heart part that I talked about at the very beginning, I feel like that's really important. Um, it's a hard, long road, so it's to me not just it's just not a business where you're like, oh, just go sell a lot of widgets and I'll make a lot of money eventually. It's just so different from that. So it's like taking that passion project a little bit further. Yeah. yeah, if you if you um, so want to if that, you want to make a million dollars of the meter, you start with two million dollars. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Any version of that saying is very appropriate, uh-huh. <laughs> um, but it is very re- very rewarding. That's not to say that people can't make that work, but it, it's a longer haul and it's a longer operation, at least in my experience. But every decision that's made about what type of meadery and what type of mead and what type of distribution and what your vision is for how grand or small or whatever, that's all going to lead to the dollars and cents that go into your budget and it's going to lead to the equipment purchases that you make and the ingredients that you need to seek out. It's all tied together. So it really starts with that that vision and that heart and but then a lot of practicality gets layered on top of that. Yeah. The more you can visualize that in advance, the better off you'll be. It's not the kind of thing, I mean, I hear people say things like, it's typically about a restaurant. Well, my wife really loves to cook, so I think we'll open a restaurant. I just can like, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's not, it's, you need a little more behind that. Um, you know, make sure, first of all, that, that you're, to be an entrepreneur, to work 24-7, to 
take all the risks and responsibilities, to follow through, to have initiative, to know to ask for help. It just goes on and on and on. And so, you know, for me, it begins with looking at yourself and your goals and your strengths and, um, and then from there, try to build it. Just like you said earlier about the Martian, um, there's going to be a lot of obstacles, but the more you, you can get solid in your vision um, and back it with numbers, you can just start to put it together. Every what uh, trip of a million miles begins with a single step. Yes. Somebody oh. said that to me early on. <laughs> really oh, my helped. God. That's like one of my favorite phrases to my business clients is, is that exact phrase. Um, and, you know, because they they get overwhelmed and, and it's so easy to do. Yeah. I, I have found easy to do. Oh, so easy to do. I mean, I'm, I'm underwater every day with the AMMA cause I'm literally the entire staff and, um, you know, for the whole yeah. organization. So the, 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 I want, I need, this has to happen. Stuff comes in fast and furious. I make lists and I, and I just sit mm-hmm. there cause, cause I do, I get buried and I get worried and then I get freaked and then I can't breathe. Yeah. <laughs> and, and given yeah. the problems I've been having <laughs> with breathing, that's bad. You know? So, um, that's right. yeah. That's right. So, so I just take everything that comes in and I dump it. I've got like a in basket thing. I've got a software program I use, um, called, uh, OmniFocus and, um, and I just dump everything into the in-basket there. And I don't worry about sorting it, you know, because that would just make me more frustrated. I just throw it all in there. And then I go in like once a week and I sort it all and mark it all down, you know, and, and then, uh, you know, organize it as I go. But I just, it, it, it gives me like amazing amounts of satisfaction to go click done <laughs> you know, for something. Mm-hmm. Even if it's just mm-hmm. a little thing, like send out an email to my volunteers, click done. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So exactly. Yeah. Yes. It's, and you got to look at it that way. It's like the, even the little things, cause you can knock them off the list. You can say, dang it. I did this, you know, and, and go That's for right. it. Yeah. And you hit on another thing for the solopreneur. You are everything. Yep. You're the soup to nuts on that, um, on that job. And, uh, so when that is the case, uh, one really has to learn how to uh, prioritize and balance and schedule and uh, be able to handle those multiple demands. And I know every entrepreneur, even those with five partners and helpers and uh, other people, we all have those skills. It's another entrepreneurial skill that's needed. Um, But when you're doing it solo, it just kind of means that it's all cumulative and the hours just uh, are, are added. You don't have the benefit of um, the, the two people working on something at the same time. Um, so it just takes a little bit longer. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It can. It can. In my experience, it does. I, I find motivation is the, uh, the biggest problem in being a, the, a solopreneur, as you, as you say it. Motivation is, is the hardest thing. If you've got one other person working on the task, doesn't matter whether they're actually helping you or if they're just, you know, sort of keeping you company and watching what you're doing. It uh, it makes all the world of difference. So keeping motivated is, is a big trick. Really good point. And for everybody, I feel like that's a little bit different. Um, but I can definitely relate to, as I now have a full-time pacing room manager, and uh, her being there has been a, me, a big motivator uh, in terms of knowing that there's somebody else there who's also with you and really wants you to succeed and you now have a little team. It definitely is a, a changing dynamic. It is, yeah. I don't have the benefit of like uh, actual human bodies uh, in, you know, like in the space with me because I'm working in the cave mm-hmm. in my office every day all day long with my <laughs> wall of screens, you know, but I, I, I have a very, I have a very vibrant online life, you know, so I'm constantly talking to people like Hamish and AJ and, you know, and Pete and, and, you know, just lots of people online that are like, oh yeah. And, you know, I bounce ideas off of them. And so they're kind of my, they're kind of my, uh, my support group, if you will, you know, of, of people that I know I can awesome. go to when I'm feeling like all alone in my cave, you know, and uh, <laughs> considering like, you know what, the hell with this for the rest of the day, I'm going to go watch TV. <laughs> That's when I well, reach out. Well, you also out. have the puppies of the apocalypse. And I have the puppies of the apocalypse, yeah, who are not in the room right now because John's Aww. home, so he's minding them. But, 
Yeah. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, it's, uh, but you're right. I mean, having people, you know, whether they're physically there or, or, you know, there in other ways is... Just knowing they're there is sometimes enough. It is, exactly. Yes, and that's true. It's Very huge, motivating. Yeah, it is. Um, okay. Gandalf, uh, who's one of our regulars, uh, was asking, uh, what did you start with equipment-wise? Was it a couple of 100-gallon tanks, something bigger or something smaller? Um, I wanted to have the ability to grow into my starting tanks. And so I started with five fermentation tanks. Um, uh, let me think. I now have 11, no, 12. Um, uh, but I started with five. I had one primary that was a 2,000 liter primary. I still have all of this equipment that I'm talking about. I had three 1,000 liter tanks that were my secondary tanks, and then um, that's four. I guess I started with six. Really, it was kind of an impulse purchase, uh, and I mean, it was a several hundred dollar impulse purchase. But at the Carolina Wine Supply, when I was getting my tanks, um, at the very end, I was like, "Oh, I really, those look really good," and so I got a couple of um, 400 liter tanks, which I just, so I had different sizes to work with. I knew that I could grow to ferment a big first batch. I could split it into the two 1,000s, or I could make a 2,000 liter batch for starters, which is kind of what I did. I started out making smaller batches just to gain knowledge and experience making bigger batches. That's another huge transitional point that is just takes time um, to figure out. Uh, that everything is different. Um, but that was my setup. Six tanks. Um, a 2,000, three 1,000, and two 400 liter. All variable volume lids. That was related to the fact that I knew I'd be making different batch sizes to scale up. And also, I knew I'd be working with fruit. That would always be um, how much meat I would make would be determined by how much fruit I got. So, it was another case where what I had chosen to make related to the type of equipment that I would need ultimately. Um, I could have gotten six lid tanks if I knew I was going to make the same size batch every time, and that would have meant a different setup. I love the variable. I love the uh, the variable height lids. Those are great. I was looking at those. Ken Tram Scott, all of his have that, and it's awesome because if you're making a small batch, you can still use that giant tank because you can just drop that lid. Right, and people tend to either love them or hate them. Honestly, um, I mean, they definitely have their pluses and minuses. Um, they have to be monitored, and you know, you can have a lot of points of potential uh, failure. Um, but I love them. I love them. I always love them. And for what I'm doing, they are perfect. And what you just said with the, yeah, small batch lid sits right there on the top, and they're phenomenal. Yeah. Just get some extra gaskets just in case. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, I know um, there was a meadery in Virginia that is sadly no longer in business, and it was not because of their mead. It was poor business practices. But he did all of his meads in um, 50-gallon conicals. And uh, you did him in the garage, you know, which was, you know, amazing. And his meads were amazing. They were really, really good. So, and then there's another one in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, Algoma Acres, that uh, everything, when I, when I visited them, which was two years ago, so they've probably upscaled since then, but they set up an old uh, decommissioned church. So the the upstairs the upstairs the main area of the church they hold events oh it's gorgeous and um, wow. they hold events and I have parties seen photos and, as soon yeah. as you said that I was like I've seen pictures uh, of that. yeah lovely yeah it's a really lovely space lovely. and the basement is a production area and so the basement's a UP they've got pretty much got permafrost up there so um, they right. uh, the you know cellar. It's, yeah it stays nice and cool <laughs> down there they had they had like three hundred five gallon carboys. Like I kid you not, the whole room was yep. stuffed full of yep. full three, you know, you know, of uh, five gallon carboys, and I was just like, "Holy crap!" You know, so um, right. you know, you can do it. I mean, they've got an operating meadery. They supply to the local stores. I know because I bought their stuff at the store I used to go to when I was in college <laughs> to get beer. 
<laughs> and, um, and, you know, so, yeah, I mean, they're, they're distributing locally and I mean, they're still very small, but they're distributing locally, but they're doing it out of five gallon carboys. So guys out there that are flipping 